Warning, I've been saving up a lot of profanity since the last time I talked to you. This week's episode of The Scathing Atheist is brought to you by Stamps.com. Honey, hymns, and by The Scathing Atheist Stay the Fuck Home Livestream Mother's Day Edition. Our moms, your questions. Saturday at 8 p.m. Eastern on YouTube. And now, The Scathing Atheist. This is Jeff from Pennsylvania. I'm one of those annoying guys who hangs out outside polls, offering you sample ballots and assorted candidate stuff that you immediately throw in the trash. As someone who normally wants to see as many people as possible, please vote by mail. I don't need to get sick, and neither do all the old people who volunteer at the polls. And at least in Pennsylvania, you can register right now without an excuse. Screw what certain politicians want. You can do it right now. So do it, please. Also, don't vote third party because it doesn't work. Diverge's law. Look it up. Because you've seen who the other party has working their poof, so you know, in fact, we did evolve from filthy monkey men. It's May 7th. And it's Make a Book Day. Way ahead of you. I'm No <laughs> Illusions. I'm Eli Bosnick. I'm Heath Enright. And from Samuel Alito's, New Jersey, <laughs> Cincinnati Swing State, and Good Husband, Georgia, this is The Scathing Atheist. On this week's episode, we'll fill you in on where Noah's been hiding. We learn that first, the Nazis came for your phone number so they could call you if you might have a deadly virus. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And Allison Gill of American Atheist will be here to quantify your suffering. But first, the diatribe. The only reason I haven't heard any of these assholes equating the murder hornets with the scorpion horse locust from Revelation is that they haven't read the goddamn book. Right. Like, I mean, the apocalypse watchers are just having a field day with this pandemic shit, aren't they? Because plague is so biblical. God Hell, the first horseman of the apocalypse is even pestilence or, or it's it's war or the breakup of a great empire or the coming of the Antichrist, but like, but like one of the common interpretations of the first horseman of the apocalypse was infectious disease even before all this COVID-19 shit started to happen, huh? Maybe you've seen that meme where they pull the uh, the 666 out of Corona. See, see, if you assign each letter its corresponding number, A for one, B for two, et cetera, and then you add up the value of all the letters in Corona, you get 66 plus, hold on, it gets better. Corona has six letters in it. Six, six, six. Never mind that coronavirus is one word. <laughs> that would be well, that would be eleven thousand one hundred and fifty five. That fucks up the whole thing. Also, never mind that it's a category of virus that includes all kinds of shit, and that the virus causing this particular disease is SARS CoV two, spelled like a fucking online banking password. But if you just use part of one of the words and then add the numbers up of the letters, you get 666, sort of, if you cheat. Obviously, that's what God was warning about in the book, and he couldn't think of a more direct way of saying, hey, look out for a pandemic in 2020. Because, you know, he figured we'd be adding up a lot of numeric codes by now and speaking English. (laughs) But, but, But my favorite effort in this regard, is the 11-step parade of horribles that's spilling out of Rick Wiles right now. He's got it that Bill Gates is going to develop a cure, or I'm sorry, wait, rather, he's already developed a cure alongside of his development of this virus itself and will soon release the cure, but it's no traditional cure. No, it's a microchip. How does a microchip fight a virus? Go fuck yourself. Rick is talking. So once Gates' microchip is out there, People can get it implanted in themselves, thereby creating some sort of cyborgian immunity that will allow them to go out even as others are still forced to stay in place. Forced? Yes, forced. But how, you may ask, if you're not fucking yourself as per instructions, will the authorities that will soon be roaming the streets and forcing the national lockdown know that you've received your immunity chip? Why, they'll have to check for the ID chip on the back of your hand and and 
just to be sure you're not faking it, they'll have to take your temperature using your what? That's right, your fucking forehead, Mark of the Beast. This always seems so goddamn weird to me. They, they pour over that book desperately looking for these hidden clues and numerological warnings that the apocalypse is nigh, but like, like their apocalypse includes a seven headed dragon rising up in a goddamn ocean like he's about to fight Godzilla. That happens fairly early on. I feel like we just wait for that to happen. Fucking seven headed dragon comes waddling up on Long Beach one day and we're going to like, we're all look to ourselves and go, Hey, look at that. The uh, 10 crowns fucking Christians nailed it. So why the fuck you got to go looking for the antichrist? Just wait for the dragons to show up and then you'll know for sure. And don't give me that. It's metaphorical shit because I fucking know it's metaphorical. Hell, I even know what it's a metaphor for, but you can't have it selectively metaphorical. The seven headed dragon can't represent the Roman empire if the scorpion locusts represent scorpions. Scorpion hornets. That's not how fucking metaphors work. If the symbol on your forehead and your back of your hand represents a symbol on the forehead and the back of your hand, you're not doing metaphors anymore. You're just making predictions and getting some of them wrong or, or all of them wrong in this case. But thus is the arrogance and willful ignorance of Christianity. Right. They have a personal relationship with the creator of the universe who loves them unconditionally with the greatest imaginable love. And they know that this is true because the guy they paid to tell them that told them that. Once you've already cleared that level of delusional self-worth, it's nothing to tack on the belief that against all odds and evidence, you live in the end of days. It's a feeling that, as near as we can tell, has been shared by every fucking Christian at every fucking time throughout history. All of them somehow certain that the fact that everybody else who thought it was wrong made it more likely that it would be right this time. And I'm hardly the first person to point out that believing one lives at the cusp of the end times makes for some shitty long-term planning. Look, we live at the absolute height of civilization. I don't doubt we'll reach higher climbs in the future, but we have not reached them in the past. Right, I get that a lot of people in this world are suffering and that there's a lot of misery, but still, there's never been a better time in human history when so many people had so much freedom, when there was so much abundance and so much convenience. There are problems in this world to solve. Yes, absolutely. And there are people who have largely been left off of all this progress. But if you measure human history by the average person's quality of life, we live at the current apex of all of humanity. But that, see, but that doesn't fit with their fucking theology. Their theology demands a broken world, and it damn sure can't abide a world that got better as it got less Christian. And, and so every war is ushering in the end times. Every earthquake is a harbinger of the apocalypse. Every new technology is a tool of the Antichrist. And every word or phrase that can be made to add up to 666 is a sign of the goddamn devil. And, and when a tragedy that is truly unusual comes along and causes great suffering over a wide area, they fucking revel in it they point to it as this long-awaited sign of vindication they kept screaming that this amazing world that humanism had crafted was flawed and terrible despite all the evidence to the contrary and so in this pandemic they see society getting its comeuppance make no mistake in the war between humanity and this virus an awful lot of christians are on covid 19 side and if that sounds hyperbolic i challenge you to find any asshole anywhere in this fucking country that's been out protesting lockdowns and and stay at home orders and mask regulations and ask them who their lord and savior is they're talking about your jesus we interrupt this broadcast bring you a special news bulletin joining me for headlines tonight uh Actually, about, I'm 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 back now, so I could I could take this the bit over. Right. Okay. But but we started this whole gag where you're dead and we're trying to cover it up. You're kind of fucking up our bit. We got a whole bit by, going. Wait, yeah. By I'm fucking up your bit by not being dead. Yeah. Sorry, Noah. It's canon now. Like Carl's yeah. love of garlic bread. It's true. I do love garlic bread. He does. He does love garlic bread. See? Okay. But, okay. But I didn't die though. I took a couple of headline segments and. And a couple of GAM episodes off to write a book about how religion is exacerbating the pandemic. Okay. Nobody's going to believe you wrote a book in three weeks, Noah. It's way more realistic that you have died. Yeah. It could be murder um, hornets that got him. Oh, and that's why we're covering it up. Oh, I love it. Yes. Okay, murder okay, hornets. But, that's but, guys, but I've, I've written the headlines and stuff for this week. I just did a diatribe. Eh, Pre-recorded. Yeah, probably. No, no I, I mentioned the murder hornets in it. 
uh, Eli could be doing a voice. He does voices. It could, I do. That's probably quack, what it quack, was. Quack, 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 quack. Why, why do I quack? Why do you go quack? Great question. Oh, okay. Well, wait a minute. Well, well, then Eli could be doing a voice of me when I do the joining me for headlines bit. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. That tracks. Yep. I guess. All right, Noah. If that is your real name. It's it's not. Oh. Joining me for headlines tonight are the red and yellow to my <laughs> green. Heath Enright and Eli Bosnick. Fellas, are you ready to go? Well, no, if I were <laughs> truly committed to the spirit of the question, I would have started talking when you said yellow. That's fair. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> That'll get you a boost in Mario Kart. Too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, now I want to play Mario Kart. So we're going to take a quick break for our, a word from our first sponsor this week. Stamps.com. And don't forget the forever stamps. I heard you the first time he then okay. right God. Hey, well, just hey guys, uh, what's up with the scuba gear? Oh, uh, Eli's going to the post office. Yeah, but I don't want to get COVID. Thus, obviously, scuba suit. Eli, why don't you just use stamps.com? What's stamps.com? Yeah, Noah, what is stamps.com? Stamps.com, you say? Tell me more. Guys, we got to do the ad. Sorry. 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 Okay. Uh, yeah. Stamps. Stamps.com. Stamps.com brings all the services of the U.S. Postal Service right to your computer in the safety and comfort of your own home, office, or anywhere else you might be hunkering down right now. Whether you're a small business sending invoices, an online seller shipping out products, or just working from home and need to mail stuff, Stamps.com can handle it all with ease. Wow. That sounds great. And now, in addition to offering discounted U.S. Postal Service rates, Stamps.com also offers UPS services with discount rates up to 62%. Plus, with Stamps.com, you won't even have to pay UPS residential surcharges. UPS and the U.S. Postal Service all through one site? That's got to be pretty pricey, though. Not at all. With Stamps.com, you get great discounts, too. Five cents off of every first class stamp and up to 40% off USPS shipping rates. And right now, our listeners get a special offer that includes a four week trial plus free postage and a digital scale without any long term commitment. Just go to stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage and type in scathing. That's stamps.com. Enter scathing. Stay safe, my friends. Oh, thank you, Noah. You know, I mostly meant your air tank is very clearly filled with helium. It says, um, your, your point. Yeah, you know what? Never mind. Right. Okay. And now back to the headlines. In our lead story tonight, in Godwin is dead news. Medicine is Hitler. Hmm. <laughs> Just so many idiots found so many ways of making that claim this week. It's baffling. I don't well, know no, how no, no, Hitler did have side effects, Heath. So that's true. <laughs> right. Well, we're going to talk about a couple of the most absurd examples, starting with Matt Staver of the Christian attorney hate group Liberty Council. According to Staver, the government of Kansas City, Missouri, is just like Hitler. Hmm. But it's it's not what you think. He was not pointing out that states like Missouri have a whole bunch of neo-Nazis in power. <laughs> Those are some of his best clients, actually. <laughs> he was explaining how tracking the spread of COVID-19 is just like tracking Jewish people in Germany right what? before the Holocaust. Well, <laughs> same <laughs> Samesies. Oh, 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 okay, Matt, with fucking one T. Let me yeah, explain his complicated get a second logical tea, asshole. Yeah, first get a second T, and then let me explain his complicated logical fucking principle to you. Just because bigots have historically accused Jews of poisoning the water supply doesn't make the people who caught you poisoning the water supply bigots. <laughs> <laughs> An idiot. All right. Well, first of all, let's let's give some credit where credit's due. Matt Staver did know that Kansas City, Missouri is located in the state of Missouri. That's a tricky <laughs> one. That's a tricky one, but he nailed it. So Overqualified credit. for the presidency, really, if you think about it. Yeah. And mm. to be a third of this podcast. <laughs> it depends so. on which third, but yeah. <laughs> and we're done with the credit section. Oh, that's I'm the done. third. <laughs> Kansas City is letting non-essential gatherings start happening again. And they're asking places like restaurants and churches to keep track of the people who show up you know, just in case the coronavirus isn't completely eradicated like we've all assumed. So, you know, you know, pogrom phase one. Right. Is what I just right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> all right. Matt, with one T, I got news for you. If the government wanted to kill you, 
you're already doing the job for them, buddy. I mean, like, they might <laughs> offer you more enclosed public spaces to meet in, but you guys are <laughs> rushing it. Great job. Yeah. Save us some of that budget. It's important, you know, fiscal conservative, no spending. Yeah. So here's the official statement from Liberty Council last week. Quote, the Kansas City government is now demanding that churches <laughs> turn over membership lists along with the names, telephone numbers, and physical addresses of anyone who enters a church. And nope, I'm just going to drop in a nope there. We'll circle <laughs> back to that in a second. Continuing the quote, the Germans did this very thing to Jews. Jesus. Collecting the names and locations of all known synagogue attendees in the early days of the Nazi regime. <laughs> End exact quote. Oh, okay, but you get that that's not what the Jews are still sore over, though, he right? He does not get that. He does not get that. No. Yeah. Matt's also pretty sure the stars pissed us off because gold clashes with black. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, whatever. Stupid joke. Gold does not clash with black. It, Pay attention. It doesn't? Versace, pre-fall 2019, road map print was literally black and gold. So there you go. Oh. Anyway, okay. um, just to be clear <laughs> about how this particular pre-Holocaust is working... In the notorious atheist Nazi stronghold of Kansas City, Missouri, the city is asking anyone in charge of a gathering place to keep the contact information of the people involved, just in case someone later tests positive as a way to contact anyone who might have been exposed. And here's the most important part. They don't have to hand in that information like it's fucking Nazi homework. That's not part of it. The city just wants each facility to have it on right. hand as a precaution. And considering how well churches did with holding secret lists of pedophiles for decades, I think they can handle a call sheet without causing a holocaust of, again, Christian people in fucking Missouri. Uh, I, I hate to say it, but like on air especially, but atheism needs more direct plots, guys. We keep going in all of these different weird directions. Okay. More plots. Don't tweet maps of Joel Osteen's house. Make up your mind. No illusions. Make up your mind. It's been pretty clear. All right, well, that brings us to our second brand new champion of Judaism out of nowhere all of a sudden, and that would be downward-facing Senator Ted Cruz. <laughs> it's, it's just his entire face. I don't know how he did Like, every yeah. feature somehow points down. It's Even droops. when he looks it up, yeah. sags. Yep, he's saggy. Yeah. So, apparently Cruz also became worried about anti-Semitism recently all of a fucking sudden. So he sent a letter to Attorney General William Barr, explaining all the discrimination in New York City. <laughs> Unlike Texas, of course, where Cruz is fostering a wonderful, inclusive environment for the Jewish faith. In <laughs> fairness, Cruz was responding to a terribly worded tweet from New York Mayor Bill de Blasio about religious gatherings spreading the virus. But in double fairness, fuck Ted Cruz. Uh, okay, but in triple fairness... The tweet from de Blasio was horrendous. Was it? it said, my message to the Jewish community and all communities is simple. Apparently, he typed all that in permanent marker. He continued, I've instructed the NYPD to proceed immediately to summons or even arrest those who gather in large groups. This is about stopping the disease and saving lives, period. Okay, wait, is, is this tweet? Covidist? Are, are we are we supposed to check our <laughs> macro organism privileges here? I don't <laughs> so so yeah. Just in case anyone missed it, De Blasio is the mayor of Plagueton right now. Yeah. He's kind of dealing with something, yeah. and he did not appreciate the giant crowd of people attending the funeral of a prominent Brooklyn rabbi in violation of all the pandemic safety orders. Valid concern. The general context here is extremely valid and very important. But then he sent a tweet at all the Jewish people of New York, not to like the one ultra Orthodox group that had the gathering, just dear you people, basically. So <laughs> obviously bad phrasing. You could have done that better. But Ted Cruz could definitely shut the fuck up and stop pretending that enforcing pandemic safety protocol is somehow religious persecution. And he's doing that to win political points. Right. He's an asshole, obviously. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. How dare he single out the group causing the problem in a tweet that clearly points out that he's asking the same thing of all people. Sure, it could be phrased <laughs> right. better, but that's yeah. true of every tweet, really. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, I guess we'll see what happens when 
the U.S. Justice Department checks on New York City being the center of America's anti-Semitism <laughs> problem. Yeah, it's important. Either way, I'm sure the Jewish community is super relieved to have Matt Staver and Ted Cruz <laughs> looking out for them. So, okay. good stuff. Now, that we did experience during World War II, and it did not work <laughs> out. Just throwing that out there. <laughs> and in covid news. Uh, you know, okay. Heath and I generally make up our own stuff, but recycling is That's good. Fine. No, is. yeah. It's okay. It's good. You, you were gone for so long, I ran out of older I, jokes. I missed, I missed part of two episodes. Still. Still. Okay. In these well, darkened still, times. Yeah. Still. In you can just say still whenever still. you want, but it's not still. Still. <laughs> Still, Still. in (laughs) these darkened times of uncertainty, it's become clear to many of us what we have to cling to. Friends, family, and the fact that Tony Spell can go fuck himself. So for those of you who missed what can only properly be called the continuing saga of Pastor Tony Spell, first, the improperly named, because he probably can't, Pastor refused (laughs) to abide by social distancing put in place by the state of Louisiana. Yeah. Then he hired Roy Moore as his lawyer. It's terrifying. Then his other lawyer got COVID-19. Then one of his parishioners died of COVID-19. And then he was like, you know what? I don't think I've earned a whole fucking sub chapter in Noah's new book yet. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it does get better because in response to the murdery McMurder he murdered, Spell created the Hashtag Pastor Spell Stimulus Challenge, where he asked his followers for their stimulus money. <laughs> he totally did. Yeah. Uh, side note, somebody, no idea who, while Noah was gone, told people to tweet pictures of dudes kissing with the hashtag Pastor Spell Stimulus Challenge. <laughs> and when you click on that hashtag now, it's full of kissing dudes. So yeah, <laughs> do not keep that up. Uh, Don't do that. That's right. That's the official policy. And definitely don't trick people with a misleading link when you don't do that. Also known as dick rolling. Guys, don't dick guys, roll I'm, anybody. I'm back now, though. Right. Fair. Back. Anyway, last week he tried to hit someone with a bus, was put under house arrest, broke that house arrest, preached anyway. And this past Sunday, he was supported by the one, the only, <laughs> the man, the myth, the legend, fat guy in a red hat. Yep. That's right. Yes. Fat guy in a red hat, Josh Forstein, led a crowd of people, many of whom were there to support Spell and indirectly commit suicide. Well, that too. Yeah. (laughs) And my favorite part is the one guy in the crowd who made one of those signs. (laughs) This guy. Oh, yes. Yeah. (laughs) This guy went to Hobby Lobby very clearly and and, and (laughs) he tried to write First Amendment. But he very clearly ran out of space and had to settle for first amend p- plus yes, sign yes, plus whatever. Yes. All right, Ellipses. So when, I, when, <laughs> when I saw that, I assumed that his buddy with the ment sign got lost. <laughs> <laughs> Just a guy with no shirt that says ment. Oh. <laughs> I thought it was a Thursday. Yeah. So <laughs> there are video clips of this and Josh is balanced. I'm going to say precariously on the back of a flatbed driver. He's balanced. Yes, yeah. He really does fill up the vehicle we use to transport livestock. Doesn't he? <laughs> so, yeah, look for more unfortunate death news to come from Tony's neck of the woods soon, either from COVID-19, which he continues to spread or because Josh Forstein fell on someone. Could yeah. Be. By the way, his red hat was gone in this video, which was very confusing. So I sad. had no I idea who I'm he guessing was. Maybe it exploded from the pressure of his enormous <laughs> expanding face. And I don't know. It looked like he had a pocket square that was made out of the remains of the hat, perhaps. Oh, like maybe over the last two weeks, somebody went and jerked off in it. I don't know. We don't know what happened to it, really. <laughs> and while we further obscure that mystery, we're going to take a quick break for a word from our second sponsor this week, Honey. Ooh, ooh, I found one. Lysol. Four ninety nine. That's not bad. Yeah, uh yeah. Pretty sure Lysol is not spelled L I E. Hey guys, what you doing? Oh hey Noah, we're just shopping online. It's so hard to know if you're getting the best price. Well, why don't you try honey? I am trying, Schnookums. No, honey is the free online shopping tool that saves you money online. 
Honey automatically finds the best promo codes and applies them to your cart, which makes online shopping finally feel as easy as it's supposed to be. He's right, darling. Anna and I used Honey for a bunch of our baby stuff. Save 20 bucks on a diaper pail. Okay, Boogie Bear. So uh, how much does it cost? It's free. Like, free free? That's right, sweetheart. Free free. Not using Honey is literally passing up free money. It's free to use and installs in just seconds. Plus, it's backed by PayPal, so you know you can trust it. Get Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash scathing. That's joinhoney.com slash scathing. Thanks, Oodle Poodle. Guys, the name of the product is Honey. Yeah, no, we know. We we just missed you. Aw. Yeah. And you wrecked it. What? It's a term of endearment. It, um, is it? I mean, it could be. A man wrote the Bible. A whore is what she was. If it's a legitimate rape. It makes you a slut, right? It, cooking can be fun. Hey, I'm proud of a man. This week in Massage. All right, so first things first, sorry I haven't been around for the last couple of weeks. Believe it or not, there's been no sexism. <laughs> I'm kidding. I actually took some time off to build formidable ramparts around my yard because these idiots in Georgia won't be happy until they get everybody killed. But don't worry about all of the deaths and economic suffering this virus is causing. My arch nemesis, Lori Alexander, already declared it all worthwhile to get mothers back at home parenting their children. And here's her reasoning. She's a terrible bitch. Nowhere near the worst sexism I've seen in the coronavirus news since the last time I saw you, though. That prize might belong to a series of Malaysian posters that reminded women not to be all bitchy during quarantine. For example, one poster told women not to nag their husbands while everybody is stuck at home. It even gave some great examples of things you can do instead of nagging. And those things include gentle humor, girlish giggling, and using a Doraemon-like voice. What does that last one mean? I am so glad you asked, and I promise I am not making this shit up. Doraemon is a robot cat from a Japanese children's cartoon whose voice sounds like Elmo got corrupted by the one ring. Now, after humans saw the posters, the Malaysian Women and Family Development Ministry apologized for them and took them down. Which is a good thing and all, but holy fuck, when you roll the Women Department and the Family Development Department into the same ministry... How the fuck is their finished product supposed to not be sexist? And I know I should keep this segment closer to home with all the social distancing orders in place and all of that, but our final story comes out of Sudan, and it actually contains good news. Well, in the sense that the last one did. It's a story about a terrible sexist thing that a country was doing and isn't doing anymore. Except this one is way worse because this country was chopping girls' clips off. But apparently they won't anymore. Or at least they're going to make some minimal effort to stop it, hopefully. But yeah, after the UN estimated 87% of Sudanese women had undergone that irreversible ritual torture, the nation finally looked set to outlaw female genital mutilation and impose a three-year prison term on anyone caught performing the act. Now, of course, this won't end the process overnight, but holy shit, at the very goddamn least, it's finally illegal. And that's as close as we get to warm and fuzzy on twins. Anyway, sorry to leave you so soon after not seeing you for so long, but that's all I've got. So until next time, which will be next week instead of next month this time, I'll hand things back over to Noah, Heath, and Eli. Thank you, Lucinda. And in, okay, but this bit is serious news tonight. If you've listened to the show for a while, you'll know that with the exception of our annual charity drive, we don't do much call to action stuff on the show. We don't tend to ask our listeners to sign many online petitions or join many marches. You know, while we're, we've always promoted secular activism and atheist community building, we tend to avoid tossing out and now pause the show and go to such and such dot com or, you know, be sure to add hashtag such and such type stuff. And there's two reasons for that. One is that, you know, that type of activism is rarely effective and often makes people feel like they've done something when they haven't. And the second is that when we do have an ask like that, We want you to know it's important, so listen up, because we've got an ask for you like that. Please marry Heath. Someone, you've seen his walls. We have to do something. No, you have not. It's a different different thing. Okay, fine. Okay, so Mubarak Bala is a humanist activist in Nigeria, and he might just need your online activism to save his fucking life. Last week, it was reported that Bala, the president of the Humanist Association of Nigeria, had been arrested for blasphemy. 
And now there's some question as to exactly what charges he's going to face and more importantly, where he's going to face them. And that matters because in Nigeria, the courts are not the same from state to state. If he is tried in the northern state of Kano, I think it's Kano, Kano, something like that. Uh, but anyway, if he's tried there, Sharia law rules the day. He will likely be executed. Apparently, explicit threats have been made to that end. Yeah, and we might not have Sharia law in the U.S., but let's remember that a majority of the Supreme Court loves to talk about states' rights and federalism, and a majority of U.S. states have the fucking death penalty right now. Yeah, no, we, can, we certainly can't look down on Nigeria yeah. for this. We have state-by-state state shit like that, too. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, okay, so that's where you come in. It matters to these leaders when they realize that the world is watching so what the human rights groups that have taken up his case are asking is pretty simple. They just want you to take a picture of yourself holding a sign that says hashtag free Mubarak Bala. That's M-U-B-A-R-A-K. Uh, or just in, insert those words over a photo that you already have and tweet it at police NG at Malami San and at M. Buhari. That's the Nigerian police, their attorney general and their president. Uh, we'll have a link in the show notes where all of the names and shit are spelled out. They they'll also have a link to a statement of support that you can sign and a legal fund that you can uh, donate to. It'll take five minutes and it literally might help save this guy's life. And 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 if one of you could marry Heath and decorate his walls, that would be great. There. Okay. Are you happy? Yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> OK, next up in headlines. Considering everything that's happening in the world right now, we've been talking a lot about the catastrophic effects of religious people getting science wrong. So we're going to change it up for a minute and talk about religious people getting a different academic subject aggressively wrong. And, you know, we picked a subject at random because they pretty much all fit that description. Mm -hmm. yep. And we landed on... Oh, please be acting like a pigeon. Please be acting no, like a no. pigeon. We landed on literature. Damn it all to hell. Yeah, so thanks to a school board full of borderline illiterate Christians... The second largest school district in Alaska of about 19,000 students just removed four extremely important books from their curriculum. English classes will no longer be teaching The Great Gatsby by F. Scott Fitzgerald, Catch-22 by Joseph Heller, Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison, and I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings by Maya Angelou. Those are all oh. gone. Oh, no, not Catch-22. How will Andrew trick those school children into reading 44 okay. pages about a dude's cheeks now? No. Catch-22 is a good book. You have a fine arts degree. Irregardless. Uh okay, just say regardless. So here's the explanation we got from one of the board members. According to V. Jeff Taylor, who, <laughs> who seems unaware that his name construction is stolen from one of the authors he just banned, <laughs> according to him, the choice to remove Gatsby was a tough one. But eventually, all that racy flapper language got to him, I guess. <laughs> and as for the other books, this is a real quote. As for the other books, I have not read the others. <laughs> oh, <laughs> uh, have I read them? Okay, have you read them? You have. Fuck. Yep. Uh, no. No, I haven't. I'm a man who bans books. And Why would I have read them? off the school board. That's official. <laughs> wow. And just for the record, if V. Jeff Taylor had read the others, especially Invisible Man, he definitely would have been yelling about, you know, Booker T. Washington's an anti-what bigot. Yes. So <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe it's better he skipped that one. I don't know. Well, to be fair, nothing nails the point of that fucking book like a white guy who hasn't read it banning it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> They might as well have banned Fahrenheit 451, yeah, which right. has happened See, that, in has. the past at uh, other school districts. It's wet. I can't. <laughs> anyway, despite all the obvious problems this represents and the fact that similar things are happening in schools all over the place, there's a bit of a happy ending to this one. An attorney who has a kid at one of the high schools in the district is offering a cash reward for any students who read all the books that got dropped. And it's working. Nice. Those titles are completely sold out in local bookstores. I'd love it if we didn't need the fucking Streisand effect and bribery to defeat religion-inspired ignorance, but, you know, whatever works, I guess. Good you stuff. You are the way underneath my yeah. way. That's, uh, no, that's not what the Streisand effect is. No, well, it is now. Her, but it's not no. based on one of her songs. And in you hate you see it news. What? Talking about what? hate. What's happening? 
Haitian people in this one. But that's not, it's not Haiti. Yeah, why not Haiti? Yeah, Haiti. See, one of the nice things about working here at the Scathing <laughs> Atheist is that we don't have to wear pants. That's true. Best part of the job. But another nice thing is that Christianity never runs out of new and exciting villains for us to tell you about. And this week's up and comer is a sort of throwback. The Church of Bible Understanding. Founded in 1971 in Pennsylvania by a former vacuum cleaner salesman, CBU went full cult almost immediately, and its adherents famously worked and work long hours for little or no pay, are told not to date, and are asked to cut off their families unless they join the church. Huh. It's just like all the other cults plus the Jehovah's Witnesses. Or just mm-hmm. like all the cults, and we should stop being so yep. fucking nice to those wackaloons and Jehovah's Witness church. Yep, that's fair. That's fair. So in 2013, they decided to get into the charity game, accepting donations to build housing for poor families in Haiti. Well, turns out that those poor Haitians were just too fancy for CBU's houses. Or as Wikipedia puts it, quote, In November of 2013, the AP investigated claims that the church was at fault for running substandard housing for children in Haiti after two homes the church runs received a failing grade from the Haitian agency that monitors such projects. Even though they claim in IRS filings to be spending about $2.5 million annually, the home for boys and girls was so dirty and overcrowded that the government said it shouldn't remain open. End quote. Yeah, the Haitian government. This building failed the fucking Haitian building code. (laughs) Right? That's the fucking equivalent of getting banned from Twitter for racism. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So it did actually remain open and stayed oh, okay. open. Not quite. Yeah. yeah. Until last month when a fire caused by the candles used by residents because they didn't have electricity killed 13 children and two adult Jesus. caretakers. Uh, but don't worry. Don't worry. According to the Associated Press, quote, for the death of each child, parents said the church offered to pay just 50 to $100 in family compensation. What? Along with $150 for funeral related costs, such as new clothes and transportation. End quote. Oh, good. They added that last thing. That's important. Yeah. yeah. Like, hey, yeah, sorry about your kid getting kind of murdered by us. Here's a shovel, a tuxedo t shirt, and an Uber. You're fine. You're yeah. fine. Yeah. Pool, Uber pool. Just right. To be clear. Yeah. How did they determine <laughs> sure. who got the 50 and who got the 100? You know what? I don't want to. Yeah. Yeah. So uh quick tag on this story to really hit home the bummer here. As Hemet Meta over at the Friendly Atheist blog points out, CBU currently has nineteen million dollars in assets, including, quote, a twelve thousand square foot house in Coral Springs, Florida, oh, where cool. their leader lived with his wife, exempt from state property taxes on religious grounds. End quote. Um yep. so Haiti owns that now, that house. <laughs> yeah. So, as Noah once said, may he rest in peace. I'm literally on the podcast with you right now. Christian charity is just charity minus oversight plus lying. (laughs) And finally tonight, in Porn Again Christian News, the entire B segment so far has been imprisoned activists, you know, who might die, banned books, and dead kids so holy fuck do we need a story right now about a jackass pastor freaking out over naked people and josh mcdowell (laughs) has our back in an interview with the christian post mcdowell warned that pornography is quote destroying more churches more pastors more marriages more people's lives more relationships (laughs) than any one thing has ever done simultaneously in history end quote (laughs) I love that he used the word destroy there as it applies to pastors. Yeah, like, right. <laughs> the whole thing he said is stupid. But I can see that word I can see that word applying to other stuff. Like a marriage gets destroyed, a relationship sure. gets destroyed. But a pastor getting destroyed. <laughs> like I'm just picturing his wife is like, hey, so I guess you'll be home a few more Sundays because of this whole thing. What about uh what, what about we do some brunch? And he's like, must masturbate, must masturbate. <laughs> Just like ball of fire. What is happening? Okay, to be fair, though, I did type pastor destroyed into Pornhub, and I get it. There is a lot of, okay, a lot on there. Hmm. All right. So the efforts to beat this problem suffered a stroke of bad luck when it was engorged by the stiff penalties. You know what? I'm, I don't need to force some apologies. Uh, we're better than that. Anyway, McDowell <laughs> went so far as to say, quote, 
Porn is by far the greatest cancer ever to the church. End quote. So, yeah. you know, not the kid rapes. I thought it was going to be. <laughs> right. I was going to guess kid rapes. <laughs> that was my first guess, too. Or the Crusades. Yeah, the, the Crusades was. was sure. Or, okay. How oh, about just cancer is the greatest cancer? How it does hmm. not comport with the notion of a loving, omnipotent God. But no, it turns out it was hentai. <laughs> okay, uh, hentai pastor destroyed even more results. This dude's got yeah. a point, guys. That, that, I've been there. Oh, yeah. And as inclined as I was to disagree with the screen, I'm pretty sure he won me back at the end by endorsing group masturbation. You guys tell me. Here's the mm. end of the interview. Quote, in the new American standard version of the Bible, 161 times the phrase one another is used and 30 sometimes <laughs> it says each other. End quote. <laughs> he also said that 98% of people who become addicted to porn will not make it out of the addiction without others around yes, them. Yes, he did. Mm. Yes. He exact did. quote. Right. That's yeah. a so, direct quote. Too. That's an official stamp on that group <laughs> masturbation thing. Well, yeah. It's two stamps. So while we go jerk off with Josh McDowell, I guess we're going to close the headlines for the night. <laughs> Heath, Eli, thanks as always. Pastor Tony Spell Challenge. And when we come back, Allison Gill will be here with numbers and data and shit. Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. Hey, Eli, what? What's the matter, man? I, I got to get some hair fast. Uh, why? Because, Heath, two bald guys with a podcast? That's insane. Everyone knows it's got to be two bald guys and a guy with hair. What? That that's not true. That's not yes, a rule. Yes, it is. All right. Well, whatever. Why don't you just try forhims.com? What's forhims.com? So luxurious. So shiny. That's right. I'm back and forhims.com is a one-stop shop for hair loss, skin care, and sexual wellness for men. So like that hair loss pill that everybody would recognize the brand name, you can get that on the internet? You sure can. Forhims.com connects you with real doctors online. Just answer a few quick questions, a doctor will review, and if they determine it's right for you, can prescribe your medication to treat hair loss that is shipped directly to your door. And then we'd have a podcast with no bald guys. D don't be ridiculous, Eli. Every podcast has at least one bald guy. But if they're not on a podcast right now, our listeners can get started with their first month free. Go to forhims.com slash scathing. That's forhims.com slash scathing. Prescription requires an online consultation with a physician who will determine if a prescription is appropriate. Offer valid only if prescribed. Three months minimum subscription. Additional restrictions apply. See website for full details and important safety information. Remember, that's forhims.com slash scathing. We are saved. Hey, how do you do that with your hair? Oh, a little, little speaker taped to my neck, remote in my pocket. Oh, huh. worth it? Oh, totally worth it. Sorry, sorry, uh, car keys. Yeah. Because those ballet slippers were a secret. Well, I don't think they will think it's adorable, Mom. Hi, I'm No Illusions. And I'm Heath Enright, inviting you to join us on Saturday at 8 p.m. Eastern for the Scathing Atheist Stay the Fuck Home live stream Mother's Day edition with special guests, our moms. No, Mom, I'm not going to sing a song. Because it's not that kind of show. I've told you this. We're going to be answering questions with our moms, and you won't want to miss it. It's going to go a lot better for some of us than it will for others. No, don't bring it, Mr. Snuggly. I told you to ship into me anyways. The Scaling Atheist Stay the Fuck Home Livestream Mother's Day Edition. Because if you're going to be stuck inside, you might as well be stuck with our moms. The uh, cell phone bill? Um. Okay, well, what do you mean again? Seriously? She's being unreasonable. You don't pay your bill? It's a family plan. Mm -hmm. Pollsters and demographers have been slow to catch up with the shifting religious attitudes of America. As non-religious Americans swell in number, pollsters still rely on the nondescript catch-all term nuns to categorize us and all the other folks that don't fit neatly into one of their mainline Protestant, Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox type pigeonholes. Even as other has become the fastest growing religious demographic, groups like the Pew Research Center seem hesitant to parse that group. So 
the folks at American Atheist decided to do that themselves or at least start that process. And joining me to talk about it today is the VP for Legal and Policy for American Atheist, Allison Gill. Allison, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. This is a super exciting. I had a chance to look over the survey before we spoke. So, so first of all, let's talk about the survey itself. What was the secular survey? What, what was the point of it? What was, your, what was your goal in doing this? Sure. The secular survey was the largest survey of non-religious people that ever been done in the country. We did it last year, starting in October. We had about 34,000 people across the country participate. And this is non-religious folks. It's not like you were just saying a moment ago, religiously unaffiliated people. It's people that affirmatively identify with one or more non-religious labels like atheist or humanist. This is really essential because the government doesn't collect data on non-religious people like they do in other minority communities. And therefore, we just lack a lot of information that's pretty essential in areas like education, healthcare, and others. Okay, so now this is going to seem like a silly question to have to ask, but I do think it's, it's important that we clarify, why does it matter that we have the actual numbers? Well, because without the numbers, we don't know the issues that are facing our community. Like we all have anecdotes about people, you know, being rejected from their homes or facing discrimination or whatever it might be, or just facing a lot of stigma in certain places in the country. But without the data, that's all it is, anecdotes. Like we can't say anything for sure. And if you can't say anything about it, you can't use it for advocacy purposes, like go in and explain the problem to lawmakers. It's very difficult to get funding from foundations to address the issue and create programs. So basically, without data, we're invisible as a community. Right. OK, that's well said. OK, so now this was a voluntary online survey. I took it myself. So for those of us who aren't super familiar with the methods of data collection, does that mean that it is not a scientific survey? It is a scientific survey. It was conducted by researchers. However, it is not a population survey, which means that it's not representative of the entire non-religious community. It's what they call a convenience sample or a snowball sample. So basically, people referred others to others who took the survey, and we used a lot of online channels to get it out there. So people self-selected to take the survey, and therefore, it's not representative of the broader community. However, we're talking about 34,000 people, so it tells us a lot about the community, even if it's not perfectly representative. Right, gotcha. So when I look in there and I see like the percentage of respondents that were African-American or that were LGBTQ, that is not the percentage within the atheist community. Correct. Okay. Yes. So, okay, let's talk about the actual survey data. I'm a data geek. So the obvious question to ask first is, what the hell are we? Are we are we atheists, nuns, free thinkers, humanists, brights? How do atheists identify? Great. That's a great question. And first of all, nuns, I think, is a separate category. That's the category, like you said earlier, that Pew Research Center and PRI often use, the religiously unaffiliated people. That's about 25% of the population, give or take. And actually, the actual people that identify with one or more non-religious labels, like atheists, are much smaller, closer to 8 or 9%. And so we saw through the survey that a significant portion, the most significant portion, identifies atheists, about 57%, as their primary relig- non-religious identity. And the second after that was humanist, with about 14%. And the other labels had a smaller smattering of percentages. But altogether, 95% of the survey takers identified to some degree as an atheist. Now, is that is that just what we tell anonymous online surveys, or is that what we tell people in the real world as well? Well, there's no way for us to know that for sure. We just know that that you know, 57% of people said that's their primary identity and 95 agreed, 95% agreed to some degree with it. However, we did look at concealment of people's non-religious identities in the survey, and we found pretty striking numbers that people conceal their, their identities um, very often, especially at school, among strangers, and at work. That can have, you know, it has a real impact on how people see the non-religious community and how it also has an impact on mental health. Yeah, well, or and and whether people see uh, the non-religious community um, exactly. also. So I, I'm going to I'm going to circle back to the mental health thing because I think that's one of the most interesting findings that uh, that I took away from this survey. But uh, before we get into that, I want to talk about bias a little bit. Disproportionately, atheists are educated, wealthy, or at least wealthier than the average population. Uh, we're disproportionately white. That makes it very awkward sometimes for us to discuss the kind of discrimination that we face. That being said. It obviously needs to be talked about. So what did the survey find in terms of bias against atheists? Where do we face it and what forms does it take? Sure. We looked at both discrimination or negative incidents in the past three years. And we also looked at stigma and family rejection and a few other types of discrimination. 
So the areas where we saw the most discrimination were in areas like the military, education, employment, and private businesses. And we know from research that PRI has done, for example, that discrimination is, is increasing in areas like private businesses over time. Among stigma, we saw the biggest, most striking differences in places that are very religious. I think that's the biggest takeaway from the report. To give you an example, I grew up in New Jersey. And it was not a very religious community. And there, you know, no one really cares if you're an atheist or non-religious person. People just don't talk about it. Hmm. But in vast swaths of the country, especially I think the two most religious states we saw were Utah and Mississippi, it is a very big deal. And we see incredible levels of stigma and a lot of discrimination. And now we can very clearly document that. Yeah, well, you know, and, and I think it's that's a really, really important thing that the survey gives us. You know, we were talking about why you need the data. This is a huge example of exactly that. When I talk to my friends in the Bay Area or in New York City, they say, what the hell are you talking about with your South Georgia ass? But, yeah, it's it's very rampant where I am. OK, so on this subject of bias, I think a lot of atheists have a we'll wait our turn attitude. When it comes to fighting discrimination, we recognize that there are other groups, other minorities that face more dangerous or more damaging or more pervasive biases than we do. So we often put ourselves second or third or last. As odd as this question might sound, why should we fight for our rights? Well, you know, I think that we're ignoring when, we, when you say things like that. I think we're ignoring the situation in very religious places where the numbers are truly you know, horrifying. People face a level of discrimination and stigma that is that is rampant and that needs to be addressed. I'd also say that if you look at people that are both, for example, non-religious and black or non-religious and young people, non-religious ex-Muslims, we see um, sort of intersectional levels of discrimination that are higher than for non-religious people themselves. So if we want to really take that into account, you know, it's important to understand where the discrimination is happening for those communities. Mm hmm. Well, and another thing I think that's super important that often gets overlooked here is you may not be the victim of discrimination or or bias that you recognize or somebody else's uh, discrimination might be worse. But you also might not realize all the effects that that bias is having on you, which brings us back to the findings regarding loneliness and depression amongst atheists. Can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. And I think you're exactly right. Concealment, which we talked about does result, we show very clearly, in increased levels of loneliness and discrimination. So we, we looked at both, uh, we have scales for both looking at loneliness, which means social isolation and feeling like you can't connect with other people. And we should say social isolation in the pre-quarantine sense of the term. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. We asked if people feel isolated, if they lack companionship and if they feel left out, basically. That's a pretty standard measure of, of loneliness, those three questions. Mm -hmm. And we also asked about depression, and we use a pretty standard measure of two questions to assess depression. And so we show that non-religious people uh, have a fairly high level of loneliness and depression, likely depression. But, you know, we can't compare directly with the general population because that's not sort of the nature of this survey. Mm -hmm. But it is fairly high, and we see it certainly elevated in areas where there's more stigma and more discrimination. Right. Okay, so... Now, obviously, one of the big points of the survey was to identify areas of need for secular people. What, what are the biggest needs that you uncovered? We found it's really important when people are able to build communities. It's an important protective factor when people are members of national or local organizations and when they are able to participate in secular community events, for example, you know, advocacy or education or social, social events. And so that was a, a really important protective factor. Also, we saw less stigma in places that have stronger laws for the prote protection of separation of church and state. Hmm. So American Atheist does an assessment of state laws in every state about how well those states protect the separation of religion and government. And those states that protect it the least, that have the most uh, religious exemptions, basically, we saw higher levels of stigma. That's interesting. Yeah. Who, who knows what the cause and what the effect is there? But one way or the other, it seems like something that we could stem. I think another really super interesting thing, if, if you'll allow me a quick digression about the report included in the report are, are, are several blurbs from various respondents where they talk about their own experiences. And one that really stuck with me was a woman in Arizona. And if I recall correctly, she was deaf and uh, vision impaired, or maybe I had it wrong. Maybe she was she was blind and 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 hearing impaired. And she spoke. She talked about how 
she didn't feel that the atheist community did enough to accommodate people with disabilities and how rarely we talk about how people with disabilities can be forced into dangerous religious situations. And I looked at that and I'm like, yeah, hey, guilty as charged. You know, that is absolutely not something I've thought about or focused on or talked about in the past. And and it's simply because her voice wasn't out there for me to hear. And because of this survey, you know, it, it, she was able to be heard. Yeah, I think that's really important. I think this is one of the major parts of the survey is getting out these voices that for too long our community has been silent. And, um, you know, originally we had hoped to get five to 10,000 people to take the survey. Within the first eight hours, we had over 10,000 people. Overall, we had 34,000 people, which shows you the need here. People in our community really want to be able to reach out and tell their stories. They feel like they, they can't, that their voice is silenced. And for the first time, you know, they're able to both get, you know, take the report. And also we asked at the end some, some open-ended questions that allow people to, to more actively tell their stories. And one in three people actually took the time to input their their longer story, wow. which if you know anything about survey taking, that's an incredibly high yeah. number. So we have over 10,000 of those. Yeah, well, you know, anybody who's done atheist podcasting or blogging or been active in the community online will know you get these emails, these messages from people who are that you've never met that are pouring their heart out to you in a way that they can't to their family, to their friends, to their spouses sometimes. And so, yeah, they, just having any type of outlet is, is obviously very welcome for those folks. Now, this reality check report uh, that, that was released on Tuesday, that is super interesting, but that is not the last we're going to hear from these data, correct? That's right. Yes, we're hoping to release a series of additional smaller reports that look at particular subsections of the population. For example, the first one I'd like to do is uh, non-religious young people. And so we have some terrific data about non-religious young people. We'd like to do it in conjunction with some of the secular youth organizations, for example, the Secular Student Alliance. So that's what we're exploring that at the moment and we hope to release it later in the year. Excellent. Well, I've got to say, I would strongly encourage anybody listening to check uh, the link in the show notes. Read through this report. You can peruse the entire thing in an hour, hour and a half. You'll learn a lot. But even just five or ten minutes glancing through it and looking at some of the blurbs and some of the data that was uncovered can help an awful lot. All right. Well, Allison, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for the data that you guys have provided. And thanks for all the work that American Atheist is doing. Thanks so much for having me. Before we put our masks back on, I wanted to confirm that, yes, I wrote a book. Uh, we don't have a firm release date or even a title just yet, but it's coming pretty soon. We'll obviously be updating you with more details in the very near future, like including next week. But, you know, set aside some reading time for me in the uh, in the near future. Anyway, that's all the blasphemy we've got for you tonight. But we'll be back in 10,022 minutes with more. If you can't wait that long, be able to look out for a brand new episode of our sister show, The Skeptocrat, debuting at 7 a.m. Eastern on Monday. An even newer episode of our sister show's Hot Friend God Off and Booze, debuting at 7 a.m. Eastern on Tuesday. And an even newer episode of our half-sister show, Citation Needed, debuting at noon Eastern on Wednesday. Obviously, I wouldn't be much of a host if I didn't thank Heath Enright for doing, like, a ton ton of my work over the last month so that I could get through this book. I want to thank Eli Bosnick for doing another ton of my work for the same reason. I also want to thank the lovely and talented Lucinda Lusions for making her triumphant return this week. I also want to thank slash apologize to Jeff from Pennsylvania, whose Farnsworth quote didn't make it into the show last week because, and I don't mind admitting this, I was burnt the fuck out by Wednesday night last week, but it, it, it did make it in this week and it remains good advice. Vote by mail. Uh, but most of all, of course, I want to thank this week's most mellifluous mammalia, Robert Stoner, Daddy, Nicholas, Greg, Lewis, Jay, Jack, Oliver, Matthew, Adam, Gavinette, Kellen, and Outrage Torch. It is an anger cake. Kevin, Renee, Darrow, Mike, Brian, North Idaho, Brian, Lee, Rob, Corey, Despair is a Luxury, We Cannot Afford, Al, Embrace Your Own Void, This One Is Mine, Keegan, Samet, Cody, George, Esteban, and Grant. Oh, you thought I could do a long list before? I don't even smoke cigarettes anymore. Robert Stoner, Daddy, Nicholas, Greg, Lewis, Jay, Jack, Oliver, Matthew, and Adam, whose cocks are so big they violate social distancing orders without even realizing it. Gavinette, Kellen, Anger Cake, Kevin, Renee, Darrow, Mike, Ryan, North Idaho, Brian, and Lee, whose IQs are as high as IQs can get until they learn to take bong hits. And Rob, Corey, Despair, Al, Void, Haver, Keegan, Samant, George, Cody, Esteban, and Grant, whose ninjutsu is so universally feared that Murder Hornet Media is running warnings about them. Together, these 31 thoroughly thoughtful men, women, gender non-conforming folks and phrases decided to donate to our disaster diversion this week by giving us money. 
Not everybody has the money it takes to give us money, but if you do, you can make a per-episode donation at patreon.com slash gettingalias, whereby you'll earn early access to an extended ad-free version of every episode, or you can make a one-time donation by clicking on the donate button on the right side of the homepage at scalingalias.com. And if you'd like to help, but not n- enough to like part with money, you can also leave us a five-star review somewhere or something, and we'd appreciate the hell out of it. Legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres. Tim Robertson handles our social media, and our audio engineer is Morgan Clark, who also wrote all the music that was used in this episode, which was used with permission. If you have questions, comments, or death threats, you'll find all the contact info on the contact page at scalingalias.com. I'm so excited to learn that like Eli just setting something down sounds like something falling, right? Like just <laughs> just an intentional move sounds accidental when Eli does it. I'm excited to hear that Eli's lying and he clearly spilled something. You're no. The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm LLC, copyright 2020, all rights reserved.